right, so with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Florence Hudson and John Moore from Internet2 Community Support. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to provide information and, and discussion on infrastructure, researcher engagement, and the data sharing spoke workshop, how the Internet2 member-based collaborative innovation community is participating in distributed big data and analytics opportunities and innovations. Florence is Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer at Internet2, a not-for-profit consortium of 315 academic institutions and 150 research organizations and industry networking environments. And John Moore is currently the Associate Vice President of Network Architecture and Planning for Internet2, where he leads a talented group of engineers responsible for developing the next generation infrastructure that supports Internet2 communities' quest for discovery and innovation. So that's the next member to John Moore. Well, thanks, Leah. Um, this is John here, and uh, we really appreciate that uh, introduction. And thank you and Carl for um, uh, inviting us here today. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunity to work uh, with the South Region um, Big Data Hub. And, and uh, I guess I didn't realize that this was an all-hub presentation, so I'm, I'm happy to see uh, uh, our friend up in New York, uh, uh, Rene Bastone, on the on the call today. We, uh, we've worked with him in a good bit in the past. so. Uh, um, I'm, I'm excited that uh, the, the infrastructure um, conversation seems to be integrating, which I think is, is, uh, is, is a great indication of the way you guys are working together, so that's fabulous. Um, so Florence and I are going to tag team a little bit today on the presentation, um, and I'll, um, I'll start out with some background information about Internet2, so just talk a little bit about, um, you know, organization and uh, what we currently have and who we generally work with. Um, I'll then discuss a few areas that are particularly uh, um, engaging for me of late, um, talking about the planning for the next infrastructure investment, and then uh, talking a little bit more about how we're trying to support the research community. Um, and then lastly, I'll turn it over to Florence uh, for her to discuss some of her innovation program and uh, we'll end up with a few areas where we're already interacting with folks in the BD Hub community and maybe get some ideas from you um, if there's further ways that we can help or interact or et cetera. So um, before I get started, any particular thoughts or questions? Okay, great, let me dig in. So uh, just add, by way of introduction, so Internet2, for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, we are a not-for-profit member-owned consortium. Um, this is kind of a more or less divisional perspective of Internet2. So um, we have a network services group. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I'll, I have a slide on trust and identity, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, we also, uh, Florence's innovation office, which she'll be discussing. So um, some of the other pieces, we have an um, organization uh, that provides uh, Net Plus services. Um, it's kind of a way of, of aggregating some of the buying power of the community um, for applications that uh, are widely used throughout the R&E space. Um, we have a very, a very um, active community engagement organization. Um, they do a lot of work uh, trying to grow the community um, in lots of different directions. Uh, they do, we do two big meetings a year. They're very engaged with kind of meeting services and pull all that together for us. And then lastly, um, there's a, a, a program called US UCAN, um, which may be of interest to this group. Um, it's uh, one in which we try to bring in um, some of the um, smaller institutions that um, the federal government is sort of uses the term community anchor institutions. So these are schools, libraries, um, uh, smaller institutions that are, you know, maybe community colleges in some cases, who are sort of, you know, part of the, the, the research and education infrastructure in the U.S., but, um, you know, are not R1 institutions. And so, um, but with, um, in partnership with our regional uh, network uh, providers, uh, we sort of bring them into the, the scope. And I think that in a lot of ways, um, you know, that's an important uh, place that we look for in terms of, uh, uh, you know, workforce development, that's kind of where some of our uh, uh, really interesting work with cities um, is happening, et cetera. So it's a very interesting partnership that we have that came from the investment that the federal government made in uh, Internet2 and the community in the BTOP program a couple of years ago. So 
Um, we do have some focus areas, which I will talk about here in a minute. So um, the, the two top priorities for us um, as directed by our board is, is really to focus on the network and trust and identity services. You can think of a lot of the other parts of Internet, too, that sort of port those two main goals. Um, the network is the thing we've been doing for the longest. Uh, we have a national footprint infrastructure, and I'll, I'll go into that um, in a little more detail in a couple of minutes. Um, to just talk about the other piece, the trust and identity uh, aspect, um, Internet2 and the, the broader community have developed uh, a couple of middleware components that are, are proving to be very useful. Um, you may have heard of Shibboleth or Grouper or CoManage. Um, these are the pieces that help us provide a trust federation uh, called InCommon. Um, and with services like Edgerome that sort of help uh, situations from a collaboration perspective when you have people visiting your campus and want to get access and get authenticated back to their institution. Um, it's a generally, you know, very useful set of middleware services. Um, I find it fascinating because they've, in kind of looking at it for me as kind of a network guy looking at what the, the T&I folks do, they built a very strong international collaboration um, that has pushed this idea out of, of federating the trust and identity function uh, throughout the RNE community. And um, I think they've done a really uh, amazing job of, of, of putting that together and promoting that worldwide. Um, currently, there, there's a big focus on TIER, which is a project of uh, a number of large campuses that have come together to uh, focus on uh, common campus deployments um, that support the, the use of this trust federation. So, um, you know, kind of another one of those situations where you get a number of people in the community who are very interested in a specific goal and they get together and, uh, you know, partner and, uh, and do a lot of great work. So it, it sort of brings into focus a little bit of the community and convening function um, that's a strong part of Internet, too. So um, I'll talk about the network just a little bit. Here's a, a snapshot of our current footprint. Um, we do provide a number of services from uh, layers one to three in the network stack. We provide those services to folks really kind of based on where their needs are. So you, you can look through this and just see that there's, uh, you know, certain places where we provide all the services where there's a lot of demand, other places where, you know, some of the services are available. Um, we have um, a number of metro areas there that you'll notice. Where we have a couple of circles, and um, in those areas is where we connect to uh, major peering points um, to uh, provide commercial peering services for the community. So besides interconnecting all of the uh, research and education institutions in the country, um, you know, we also provide um, uh, commercial peering for the campuses so that they can get to, you know, efficiently get to cloud services, to major content providers, et cetera. Um, most of those uh, metro areas also contain um, exchange points that are either provided by us or for, um, or by other members of the community so that we can exchange traffic with other research and education networks um, in other countries. So those are sort of our international peering points. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about the, the international aspect of things a little bit. So let me just stop there uh, as you look at this particular. Any thoughts or questions on what I've gone through so far? Okay, let me push on. So um, this is kind of a, a little different perspective, uh, same topology, but um, this sort of highlights some of our uh, partners and what, what we've sort of recently been calling the, the ecosystem. So these are all the, the are what we refer to as connectors. They're the campuses and uh, the regional partners that allow us to extend our reach. So if you think about Internet 2 services, we really provide services primarily to the connectors and not directly to campuses. Uh, unless, of course, your campus is a connector. There are some of those, right, the, the, a, a campus who would connect directly to the Internet 2 backbone. In a lot of cases, um, you know, there are regional networks. So for those of you sitting in North Carolina, uh, MCNC is the local regional network, uh, and they've been a strong partner for many, many years. 
Um, you know, so it's a, it's it's not a hierarchy. It's a it's really a collaborative and cooperative environment. And um, you know, in general, MCNC is a statewide nonprofit. Um, most of the connectors are function somewhere along the line like that. They're either a state network or uh, there's some sort of a nonprofit um, that functions either within a state or a region. Um, MCNC, I, I actually had worked for them for a number of years, so I know that organization pretty well. They're about a 100-person organization that does a lot of stuff in the community. Um, some of the connectors are, um, it's basically just a router in a, in a location somewhere and a couple of people to run it and organize the community. So uh, the connectors vary all over the place, and it's a very interesting and challenging environment to work with them. Um, so just in terms of the, um, give you a little snapshot of kind of how our uh, traffic demand has grown over the years. Um, the chart on the bottom right here uh, kind of shows how we've grown. Um, one of our big uh, efforts from an operational perspective is to try to keep ahead of the demand. Um, the way we engineer our network, uh, we try to keep as much headroom as possible for uh, bursty research traffic. So if there's a big uh, um, uh, dispersal of data, for instance, from the Large Hadron Collider in uh, Geneva uh, that's going to Caltech, uh, you know, we want to have the headroom on our network um, that allows us to kind of burst to that particular capability. And that's sort of one of the general engineering principles that we've we've uh, adhered to over the years. Um, we have actually grown, even though we say it's a 100 gigabit backbone, uh, we have grown a number of these segments um, to two to 300 gigabit um, and run them in parallel. Um, it sort of shows that we're pushing the edges of the technology a bit and some of our forward facing uh, efforts are gonna look at, you know, sort of what's the next step from 100 gigabit, is it 400 gigabit, is it 200 gigabit, maybe a terabit, right? So um, we try as best we can to get the most out of the technology we have in hand, but we're always looking towards the future um, to try to see what the next thing is and try to get there ahead of uh, just about anybody else. Um, so I mentioned the international thing briefly. Uh, our exchange points actually allow us to connect to some of these uh, transoceanic circuits. Uh, a number of these are provided by uh, some of our, either ourselves or some of our national r and &E partners. So um, we have a good collaboration in the North Atlantic with a number of uh, European and Canadian providers of r and &E services uh, where we partner on um, uh, uh, actually a 300 gigabit connection that crosses the Atlantic. Uh, where and it's it's an interesting partnership where you know each of us invest in pieces of it and then we run it operationally as a unit. Um, more recently, we've actually um, uh, bought a circuit from Los Angeles to Singapore, and we're starting to try to develop a little bit more of a similar collaborative organization uh, within the uh, um, the Pacific region. And so that's really kind of in its formative stages. Um, but you know, we we have a lot of um, interest in that area in particular, obviously there's a lot of uh, growth in the R&E sector uh, in Asia as in other sectors. Um, and I think there's something else I wanted to point out. Oh yeah, and, and in addition, uh, the National Science Foundation is also funding um, some links across the oceans uh, via their IRNC program. They've been doing that for a long time. And again, what we try as much as best we can is to try to coordinate those investments um, and just kind of make it all work together. Um, it's really important, um, these connections are growing in importance because of the, um, uh, the, the nature of science these days and the fact that a lot of the um, data intensive uh, science use is uh, international collaborations. So, so uh, just a couple things uh, about how we're sort of changing and as I mentioned, some of the things that are keeping me busy these days. Um, we, um, we're at a phase where we need to be thinking about the next infrastructure investment. So our time horizon is, is two to five years and beyond, really, at this point. Um, we're going through a requirements gathering process. It's been, uh, it's been really great um, of late. We uh, have gotten some fabulous input from the community. And um, so in, in addition to some specific things that they need from a requirements perspective, we've also gotten some really interesting kind of guiding principles. So. 
Um, they're very interested in, the community generally is very interested in experimenting. Um, they want a platform where they can uh, try things. Um, they're less interested in a forklift upgrade, so they don't want us to plan it on paper, uh, go out and send out an RFP, buy a bunch of stuff, and then put it out there, and then, you know, just sort of have a flag day and just turn it all on. They'd really much rather see an incremental approach where uh, we can try things uh, in partnership with the community, um, find out the things that work, figure out how to get those into production service, and then, um, you know, if there are things that don't work, stop doing them. <laughs> and so uh, part of that, I think, is driven by the, just the rate of change um, that we're seeing in the, in, the, in the community. The hardware is commoditizing. Um, you know, software is becoming a really important component. Um, we have to be able to more flexibly deliver services where, they're, where and when they're needed. And we have to be able to differentiate a little bit better between what the academic enterprise needs, um, what the folks in the data intensive science community need. And, um, you know, one community that we've been supporting for a long time is the network and distributed systems research. The folks who are sort of want to, inf in, want to uh, do research and experimentation on the infrastructure. So um, I think, you know, wh where we're at with that is, is that uh, we have a big meeting coming up in D.C. in May. Uh, we're hoping to have sort of the first draft of the requirements. And in particular for this community, I would really like to uh, share that with the BD Hubs group. Um, I, you know, I have uh, talked to folks. Uh, Renee and I have some great conversations over coffee um, about this. It, it's hard for me uh, to um, ask for requirements from this community with a black sheet of paper. So um, what I'm hoping to do is if we can give you at least an early draft of what we're hearing from the, the people that we normally hear from in the community, um, I'm hoping that that will spur some interest and uh, we'll, you know, be able to maybe have a better conversation um, with this community about what the needs are um, for the big data community and how we can start tailoring the infrastructure, uh, you know, for your requirements. So uh, look for that after uh, our global summit meeting in May. Uh, hopefully I can, um, with, we'll figure out what the appropriate mechanism is, but I'd love it if we could circulate that, um, you know, through the community and get some good feedback from you. Um, and then lastly, um, for my part here, I just wanted to talk about the fact that we are um, engaging uh, on an effort to try to beef up our research engagement activities. Um, we've uh, brought Jim Bottom on board, who's a former CIO at Clemson University. Um, he's been working with an NSF-funded project called ACIREF for a number of years. And um, we're trying to take that model and grow it so that um, we can scale those kinds of uh, facilitation engagements out uh, to a national audience. Uh, we've pulled together a great advisory group uh, of people um, uh, throughout the community um, in various places, folks from Exceed, um, uh, folks from Science Gateways, um, you know, a number of uh, regional folks and CIOs. Uh, folks representing the, 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 you know, the research community. So it's, it's, we're hoping to get some really good advice on how to appropriately uh, move the needle. The idea is that campuses need uh, human beings in the right place to leverage the technology. Um, those folks need the kind of skills that uh, uh, allow them to do, you know, the appropriate level of integration of the IT structure to properly support um, the research community. The way I tend to think of it is, is this sort of, um, you know, we have a, uh, an infrastructure that is somewhat generic, and what's really needed is some level of customization for the specific needs of the researchers. And, um, you know, sometimes it's really just about customizing the operational profile, right? People who are using the, the, the infrastructure need to understand who to call for help to set it up or when it breaks, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, aspects to facilitation, but we're hoping to see if we can um, bring those to the forefront and, and maybe try to engage a little bit more with the research community. We have a scaling issue, for sure. Um, you know, a small number of resources with a fairly big uh, program of what we'd like to do. But um, we're hoping that um, we can organize the community in such a way to try to leverage all the talent that's out there 
um, and see how we can make it better for everybody. So with that, I'll turn it over to Florence and she, on her uh, innovation program. Can we talk about this? Oh, let's go up here. No. Okay. Okay, great. So um, I joined two years ago, Internet2, and it's been so fun. And I get to work with a lot of you, which I'm very grateful for. And when I joined, the idea was for the Chief Innovation Office to get established to figure out where the puck is going and make sure that we have the right hockey sticks, ice, um, Zimboni, whatever it is that we need to be able to help the scientists and researchers and educators get where they're going. So the first thing that we did is we did a member survey and asked them, what are the areas of open collaborative innovation you want to work on? I think it was 8,800 humans at the time. I'm sure we're over 9,000, maybe we're close to 10 now. And the three answers that came back were the top was end-to-end -end trust and security. About two-thirds of the respondents chose that. And it was multiple choice. You could pick more than one and write in anything you wanted to. Um, the next was distributed big data and analytics, which directly aligns the NSF big data hubs handily. Uh, this was in May of 2015, so I guess we guessed you guys we were going to be doing this, um, or the members did, and then the Internet of Things. And so what we did is we convened three um, innovation working groups. Alex Feltis is actually one of our original co-chairs of the Distributed Big Data and Analytics Working Group. Thank you, Alex. Um, and then we have three co-chairs from around uh, the community for each one. We have researchers like Alex. We have professors like Raj Viramani out of UW-Madison that runs the IoT lab, is one of the co-chairs of IoT. We have CISOs like Mark Kather, who's the Chief Information Security Officer at uh, UMBC on end-to-end -end trust and security. So we have a real good mix of different facets with different points of view. And we've grown from a startup, I guess you would say, in a global summit of Internet 2's May of 2015 to over 330 people that are involved in this now. And um, the key areas were brought forward as use cases by each of the working groups. So the top one, um, it has, you can see, something that we created actually with IEEE and NSF around tips for IoT, trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security. It was interesting. The end-to-end -end trust and security and Internet of Things Working Group very quickly said, we need them. Like, they both wanted to work together because they realized end-to-end -end trust and security and Internet of Things was a big issue. And it evolved into an IEEE-funded event that was held at George Washington University um, about a year ago, and we created this vision of tips for IoT. And actually, I just left a call with the ITANA organization, which some of you might be aware of. It's IT Architects in Academia. And Ken Klingenstein, who I call our trust and identity Yoda, and uh, Jim Phelps, who runs ITANA, actually had a group of about 15 or 20 folks from different universities around the country talking about how enterprise architects need to create a framework for all this stuff, you know, and figure out where they go from there. Um, the way we've, uh, we have this laid out on this page was the way we used it at the NSF Big Data Hub PI meeting a couple weeks ago in D.C. is that a lot of these areas do align with what's going on in the hubs, which is really cool. Um, so if you see in the bottom left, the distributed big data and analytics area, all of this is part of what's going on in the hubs. Uh, at the time when we created these working groups, Mark Hoyt, who is uh, one of the other co-chairs on distributed big data analytics, was leading a discussion around this at Internet 2's Technology Exchange, the fall event that John Moore was talking about. And Mark said, well, what we should do is connect with the NSF Big Data Hub. They're all over this stuff. We're like, okay. So that's what we did. And so that's what we're doing very proactively now. I'm very honored to be on Renee's steering committee for the Northeast Hub. And I worked a lot with their data sharing spoke, which we'll talk about. Um, for smart campuses and cities, Renata is going to be running a smart campus and cities workshop April right after Global Summit. So I'm flying to Atlanta from D.C. at the end of April, and we're going to be talking about challenges and opportunities there. And of course, in healthcare and life sciences and genomics, Alex is one of the leaders in that. And we see a lot more going on with that. As a matter of fact, Melissa Cragen reached out to Internet2, and John Moore and the team are actually engaging with the University of Illinois professor now who's getting ahead of it, which we love, by the way. So if you anticipate <laughs> that you're going to need some help, we'd love to be able to try to help figure it out ahead of time. And so they plan on having large genomic data transfers with Africa and with Europe, I believe it is. And so we're and getting, Canada, right? is that correct? And Canada. Yeah. And Canada. Mm -hmm. And so we're helping with that. And we'd like, and the reason we want to be, we, we love that you let us come and listen, is we want to listen and then find ways that we can help. And so don't hesitate to ask us. 
Um, on the Internet of Things, we created an IoT sandbox with IBM. I came from IBM. I was there 33 years before I joined Internet2, so I got them to help us create this sandbox, which is uh, their Bluemix DevOps environment for creating IoT applications. And then we also have some smart grid work going on around the, around the uh, community, and actually there's a lot going on down at, you know, RENC and NCSU, uh, with Ronnie Chakraborty and Yufeng and all those uh, folks, um, and I know that RENC's on the phone. And actually, what came out of the, uh, one of the key things that came out of the data sharing spoke workshop that Renee and the team hosted at Drexel University at the end of September, right after TechX, there's a real pattern here. I fly to NSF stuff right when I'm done with Internet 2 stuff, which is very interesting, psychologically. Um, and, it, and it was a meeting hosted at the Metadata Research Center at Drexel. And we discussed these ideas about data licensing and how lawyers get in the way, and once they find out, you have to wait six months to share your data. How do we kind of customize this but make it efficient at the same time? And then when we were chatting and all the hubs were there, um, we said, well, let's find like a real-life use case. So we're not just creating a vision of how we can make this better. And so Fen, who's actually the program director for the Big Data Hubs at an NSF, suggested we hook up with the Smart Grid spoke, which is out of the South. So um, Jane Greenberg, who is at Drexel, she was the one who hosted the workshop on data sharing at the end of September, and I are going to be going down to Maladin's um, Smart Grid Big Data Workshop in April at Texas A&M uh, to talk about how we can work together, how we can use that as a real-life use case, which has data issues, regulatory issues, and then bring in, you know, the data sharing side of it, legal side, policy side. Um, Renee, is there anything you want to add to that about how we're working together on that? Okay. So I'll keep going. He might be on, on, uh, on mute. Um, so what we're looking to do is continue working with all of you and listen to how we can help, and then, you know, don't wait for us to hear it. Please reach out proactively. On the next page, um, this is a view of this collaborative innovation community we created of these three working groups, which actually begat use cases in Smart Campus. We have a Smart Campus initiative with a Smart Campus CIO Advisory Council of 11 CIOs. It was 10, and then one of them moved to another university, and she wanted to stay on it, which is a good sign. And so now um, we've grandfathered the new CIO from her university, and now she's there as well, so we have 11. Um, plus, we have a smart grid focus group we're creating, because what I found is that as I go around and talk to universities, and I do that quite a lot, there were a lot of people asking for synchrophaser data, and PMU data, phaser measurement unit data, and so what we can start doing is bringing them together as a focus group and a special interest group, and we're starting to do that. So one of the things we're anticipating is that Maladin at Texas A&M will, um, will be announcing a synchrophaser consortium and then um, when we're down there in April, so hopefully we'll be able to get the family together again around the Internet2 community that care about this stuff. There are folks at NCSU, at Lehigh, um, at RPI, a number of institutions, the University of Arkansas, so that we can help the researchers collaborate. And then what we do is we watch and listen and say, ooh, is there anything we should do to help them? And that's where John and I have a great partnership. Um, because he has the technical team that understands that better, which is wonderful. And so this is a view of some of the folks we're working with. It includes industry members, university members, national labs, agencies, all sorts of folks. So as um, what we're doing today and as we move forward, we would love to continue to help uh, coordinating use of the current infrastructure for current and future needs for the big data hubs and the researchers and scientists you're supporting um, here and for collaboration around the world, as John mentioned. Uh, we can help coordinate with the state and regional networks and international providers, and that's part of what John's team will be doing as we look at data sharing from Illinois to Canada as well as Africa and Europe. How do we do that? You already have a lot of great, um, you know, connections. I know CAS is really involved with you all. You have RENC there. Um, MCNC, I'm sure, is very involved as well. Uh, but we can help in other areas as, as required. Um, we're participating quite heavily in the data sharing spoke out of the Northeast with the licensing model and ecosystem for data sharing. And I was asked by a number of people for the report. So here's the hot link for the report that came out of the data sharing workshop at the end of September. And we're planning to do another one in the fall, but in the meantime, we'll be at the Smart Grid Big Data Workshop in April so we can look at a real wide use case. And as you heard, we're engaging in the genomics data transfer needs out of the Midwest. And so what we want to do is incorporate all your needs into our future infrastructure and give, really give you a very direct voice into what John is 
listening to to create this next generation network plan um, for today and our future needs. So we'd like to hear from you today and all of your friends, you can tell them we want to listen um, and, and in the future. And that's what we wanted to share today. Any questions or comments? Thank you. So we're we're ten minutes over time. So if we could just get a, a one or two questions, that would be great. So uh, this is Stan. I had a quick question, if if it's okay for me to ask it. Yeah, please do. So, Florence or John, um, I really agree with you that this idea of personnel available to assist people with. You know, the, usually the um, the hard part is kind of on the edge. So, so how do you all foresee that playing out in, in the near future? And I'll mute myself and listen. Yeah, thanks, Stan. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, good to talk to you again, sir. By the way, um, um, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, there was a time when NSF was looking at uh, CI engineers. And there is a, um, you know, still an effort to, um, you know, build a community of those folks and to try to recruit them. Um, you know, they're a little like unicorns, though. <laughs> they're really, you know, they're beautiful and it's nice, but they're really hard to find. Um, and so uh, I think that the approach that we're trying right now is sort of a team approach to try to put people in different disciplines together. And what the, the way we've approached it is to say that Internet 2 is, um, you know, trying to um, sort of jumpstart the team. I'm putting resources from my area into it, um, and I'm trying to then, um, via this advisory group, um, you know, sort of create a little bit of a coalition of the willing um, we're going to start out with doing things like the, just, for instance, the engagement that we have with the Midwest folks, where they've come to us and said, you know, I've got to move a lot of data across international lines. I know it's going to be a challenge. You know, let's, why don't you get in on the planning and help? And that's the kind of engagement that I think we'd like. Um, from that, I think we're going to learn a lot and hopefully build some uh, process and best practices out of that, um, I'd also love that if we can grab people that we help. So in other words, if we go and, and you know, bring a team to a specific area to help with the project or a region, um, and, you know, we end up doing some level of workshopping training, I'd love to be able to take people from that and say, hey, okay, you go ahead and help us with the next one, right, and sort of grow the community that way. So. It's, you know, it's hard because it's a big job and um, it's hard to find the right people. But, uh, you know, fortunately, it seems like a very enthusiastic group of people at this point. Uh, we're having our first face-to-face -face meeting of the advisory team at Global Summit in uh, April, so I'm very excited about that. So does that answer your question, Stan? It does. Thanks a lot, John. Sure. Great. Any other questions? Anyone on the line have a question? Okay. Well, with that, we will thank you so much, uh, John and Florence. That that was uh, really fantastic. I, I, for me, I got a lot out of it because I wasn't as familiar with everything you were doing. So I appreciate it. Hey, hey, Leah. If there's if there's a second, I did want to ask Florence a little yeah. bit about the IoT and and privacy and security work. Sure, please go ahead. Sorry, I, it it took a while for my for my uh, to, to yeah. find the controls for to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> so Florence, what, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing with trust and security, and and are you working right now with any kind of national scales effort, national scale efforts, whether it's in transportation, smart cities, you know, any any of the above, just just to get a sense of the work you're doing, I think, and we've talked about it a little bit before, but not in any detail. So it would be it would be helpful, I think, for me at least. Right. So we did uh, come together and bring a number of the members, and actually non-members in academia, together to talk about what would this tips for IoT and smart and connected communities look like. 
And so um, we're looking at how we can deploy that. There was an SF solicitation, whether or not, you know, we're fortunate enough to get it. We're thinking of how we can bring a, our, everyone together to work on it. There's a smart grid effort. Aranya Chakraborty wants to work on that from NCSU. Maladin Kazanovich from Texas A&M is interested in working on that. And when we go to his workshop, Renee, the one thing he doesn't really have really front and center in that workshop is, is privacy and security, which I think is a key issue in smart grid, and he knows it too. So I think that's part of what we're going to talk about. Is there a follow-on that we could do together around that space? That could be a piece of it. Um, he's also looking at how the smart grid is really you know, the lifeline for the future smart city. So we're, we're just starting to get people focused on that. We started talking to Yale about this topic in the Internet of Medical Things mm -hmm. um, and how you really need to worry about all these spaces around that. And they're very interested in collaborating on that because they have the medical school as well as the hospital as well as Medtronic, like in East Hartford or something like that, as well as the Center for Bioinformatics and Innovation and Technology, something that sounds like that. Um, it's an acronym. Um, and so we started down these paths, and we started the work with IEEE. It's really more visionary right now. Um, the two things that are happening in the community to try to push this forward beyond the smart grid discussion, the smart cities discussion, is the ITANA discussion that we just started. Um, and I could tell you more about that. But I, I just left that call, and they're looking at how does the campus deal with all this stuff. Um, and then um, there's also some work, um, well, let's see what else is there. Though there are a number of, you know, things we've started. There's Princeton has a Center for Information Technology Policy, and they'd like to host a workshop on tips and ethics for the Internet of Things on a smart campus. Because people are starting to talk about what are the IoT ethics that came out of the GW meeting we had at George Washington University a year ago with IEEE and NSF is, how do you teach people that when they create a device, they have to worry about trust and identity and privacy protection, safety and security? And if grandma has a glucose meter on that actually is wirelessly connected, and she looks at it and she says, 3,000, that can't be right. And she doesn't know what to do before her glucose meter talks to her insulin pump and gives her too much insulin. What do we do about that? So we're actually going to start talking about that with Princeton hosting a workshop that we're hoping to have in the May or June time frame. So we have organizations that want to start diving into it. We put this on the table. There was an EDUCAUSE article about it last summer so we could start worrying about it. I, could, I see this, Renee, as Houston, we have a problem, you know, being an aerospace yeah. engineer, right? And now what do all the smart people, how can we help? And it's not Internet, too. It's the community of smart people, and we're just trying to help people come together around it. So, so you're at the beginning, then, of, of finding some of the use cases. So, so there's, there's plenty. We can talk more about this offline, but all of, all of the above, I think, are, are things that are very relevant to even discussions that I had this morning. So, so that's great. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Lauren. We would love to have that. Yeah, so John and I would like to have a cup of coffee with you about that in the near future. <laughs> yes, if, as, as long as John's involved, because he's, he's my coffee connoisseur friend. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, Renee. We can do it. We know where to go. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Renee. You.